in and out of bars, and Fats went with him, and while his dad stood at the bar and drank uh, boiler makers, he'd hatch out of uh, booze yeah. and chase it with beer. And Fats went to the lunch counter. Uh, in uh, those days, everybody had free lunch table. And, uh, <laughs> Free so, food is probably years. It's probably years lit up, didn't they? When you heard that. All right, and uh, <laughs> well, all the time that the old man drank at the bar, Fat stuffed himself <laughs> with uh, bologna sandwiches and yeah. you know, whatever they had to offer. We can just see him now in the food line. Well, you know, there was a, a line that people have said for years, where they said that or he had said that he learned everything he he knows from imbeciles. He does exactly the opposite of what they do, you know. And being in all those pool rooms and all those circus atmospheres on the creek, on the street corners where there's people crowded around and whatnot, when he was a young man, he probably, if he did everything the opposite of what they did, boy, he became a smart man quick, didn't he? Was did he go? Did he go to any schooling? Did he have much schooling, like high school or college or? I think he went to some high school, but not. No, I don't think that he finished high school. Yeah, he went to a different school. Yeah. <laughs> A school that very few graduate from. Right. But he did. He was probably the uh, teacher you know. instructor. And yeah. Do you remember what year though he played his best pool? Roughly, like well, like a four or five year started, span. We started on that seventy calling home. When you first was, met him, was he playing his best? You think, or close to it? Yeah. Was he? In forty one. So he was in his late twenties then. He. Yeah. He was 28 when he and I were married, mm -hmm. and uh, from that time until uh, we were married in '41, I'd say until 1950, uh, he was at his top speed. Well, that's good. I mean, what was the most memorable match that you saw him play against anybody? Money-wise. I get that money-wise, but also just a match that was kind of special. Do you remember any in particular? Because you watched a lot of them, right? Yeah, I sure did. Um, I mean, matches are each match makes each match is different. They're all not just for money. Sometimes some of them have different things, you know, like grudge matches, or some of them are for a uh -huh. car, or some of them are I don't know. You've heard the name Hubert Cox? Yeah, the older man from yeah, Danny Warbucks. Yeah, Daddy Warbucks. And he's the guy that taught Nick Farner how to play, took him under his wing at Johnson City. Uh-huh, right. Before he died. Uh-huh. Oh, before Coach died. Yeah, Hubert, yeah. Uh, well, Fats liked to beat Coach. Not that he didn't like him, because he did like him. And Coach liked his own game, just like Fats liked his own game. Right. They thought that they were you know, in, in their class. Was this in one pocket? Yeah, always one pocket. Okay, yeah. And, uh, Did he invent the game? Who invented it? Did Fats ever tell you who invented the game? No? Well, uh, as long as you and I remember, there's always been eight ball. Right. And nine ball. And straight pool. Right. But who invented one pocket? I don't know, unless okay. maybe it was Fats. I don't yeah. know. I just wondered. Hmm. So him and Hubert Cokes, that was uh, probably one of your most memorable matches when he played Hubert Cokes? Yeah. Where would they where did they play at? Well, uh, it used to be that it was a like a nice weekend. Fats and I had been on a long trip and everything. We came back here. Uh, to Southern Illinois to rest and just take it easy for a few days. Yeah. We get in the car sometimes and go to Evansville and uh, check into a hotel and I could rest and Fats would rest when he wasn't playing pool and he and Coach would play some pool. And it would start out maybe cheap enough, neither one of them cared how much they they bet any amount it seems. But uh, 
the money wasn't the thing. It was who could beat who. Yeah. Grudge match. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think every great player has that one person that... Right. And that, a lot of times they, that one person is somebody that, that technically has beat a lot of people that they haven't beat, but they can always beat them when they play. Because somehow they mentally have an edge or something like that, and that's usually what it is. A lot of people don't realize how tough it is to play and then how much rest you do need after a while. I mean, it just wears you out because it's it's such a uh, a mentally draining game to play for, for days and days. After a while, after two or three days, you go, your mind just kind of rolls over and you go, I'm done. I need to go rest. So, but Hubert was. Did he, did he end up beating Hubert or did they kind of win him win a little Hubert bit? Hubert was a very good player. Yeah, he was. Very good. Uh, now, they called him Daddy Warbucks. Is it because he had all the money or what? Was he an oil well, man? He, or? he looked like Daddy Warbucks. Well, that's right. He looked like him. You want to take a break here for a minute? No. So that was probably the most memorable match, watching those two go at it. Yeah. Well, it was memorable for each of them. Uh, one right. liked to play the other. Mm -hmm. And did you, when you, did you ever hear the name Titanic? Yeah. Well, Titanic you, Slim Thompson, is it? Yeah. Yeah. A.C. Thompson or Titanic. Um, he lived in Evansville and he was older, like Hubert. And, uh, Wasn't he the, the guy that would bet like how many birds are on a wire or something like that, or bet on yeah. odd and even license plate numbers uh, and cars? Far out, uh, Bizarre stuff. But yeah, he, very. But he always had the best of it, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> he uh, bet that uh, he could drive a golf ball farther than anybody. Yeah. And, uh, and the bet was on, and he took all uh, the bets, and uh, he waited until it came an ice storm, and uh, he hit that ball someplace in a park in Chicago with lots of ice on the ground. Of course, it flew through the air until it was out of sight, and then on this ice, it just kept on going, you know, when it hit the ground. Yeah. And he, that was one ridiculous bet he made, and he, uh, bet he could throw a pumpkin uh, farther than anyone, and uh, the bet was on, and he had a trick pumpkin, a uh, little freak growth, little bitty thing, and sure enough, he, he threw it over the Empire State or, or something. Yeah. And another thing. He was in some southern town, Memphis, I guess. No, Fats was, right? No, Ty was. Okay. And uh, so he was talking. He made an appointment, uh, made it a point to meet uh, a politician on the corner. He knew that this politician would be around in this corner at a certain time. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, Ty was there to meet him. So Ty also knew that there was going to be a colored funeral come past that corner mm -hmm. at uh, that time. So he's talking to, to this politician and they're talking just about the time of day and one conversation and another and um, here comes this big colored funeral. and. Uh, so they're standing there watching this funeral pass by, and there goes the hearse, and there goes the other cars. And Ty says to this politician, he says, you know, that story about the colored people are getting stronger and stronger, and there's more colored in this town than there are white men. And this didn't fit well with this politician. He knew that, too, right? Yeah. yeah okay. And the argument was on, and 
oh, this conversation came up just in advance of the recession coming past there. And uh, this politician says, well, I'll bet you and I'll take you and show you the records in City Hall, how many whites and how many colors there are in Memphis. And about this time, here comes the funeral possession. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ty said, well, let's just stand here and count heads for 15 minutes. And they did, and Ty won the money. <laughs> That's one of the freak thing. Yeah. Um, did, did he have a mentor, Fats? Did he have somebody he always talked? Well, if he did, I well, would uh, be Coates. Would it? Yeah. Did he ever learn, did anybody ever teach him, like in his early years, how to play? Like kind of show him a few things? Or did he just learn the hard way by watching and being smart? He, uh, he uh, understood. He had a, a mind that was sharp. And uh, so if he saw a move that he liked in the game, uh, executed by some real smart, why well, he didn't practice until he perfected. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was self-taught to, I would say. Yeah. When he was at home practicing, how long would he practice each day? He didn't, uh, he hardly practiced at home. Did he? And he never gambled at home. Yeah. He, uh, when old friends or people would stop by to say hello, he'd get up and maybe shoot a half a dozen shots or so. Yeah. But that's all. Well, what was his biggest money game you were going to say earlier? Well, I can't remember because he's played, paid, played for some staggering sums. Yeah. And uh, I would know to, for sure what to tell you. I know he's played for uh, uh, three, five, thousand a game and uh, then our play for a pot that uh, they both put up you know and somebody hold the stakes yeah it might amount to ten thousand winner take all did he always just bet money or did he bet cars or other things I don't remember him ever betting uh, anything won. like that he's won cars though right off of people I think so, uh, yeah. Because there was a line once at Johnson City that he had said that... Uh, made pedestrian. He says, when, he says, when it's over, I may be in the used car business. He said that once. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, he, he often just, said he'd make a pedestrian out of somebody, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he had his ways with that. So, he didn't really have a mentor. So, basically, other than Cokes, he just kind of learned from the land of hard knocks. What made him so likable? What do you think the key to it was? Why was he well, so... He, he was sharp. He had uh, something to say uh, that wasn't a repeat of uh, uh -huh. anybody else's. It was something different. And... Uh, like when you go to the room with him, you'd hear stuff some days that you'd never heard before. Like the next day you might go in and he may say something completely different, right? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the way to do it. Because it doesn't become old. No. It's always new and fresh. Right. And that had to be kind of, is there any, what, what kind of things did he do that, that kind of got in under your skin, that kind of changed your personality? Anything that he did that you kind of, kind of did after a while or liked or but, uh, caught up? I would try to follow suit and be like him. Or, or mannerism that you picked up that he had. I mean, or... Uh, well, I like his smart cracks. I like that kind of conversation. And, uh, I Like, guess, give me an example of a good one. Can you think of one? Well, I... Uh, I made a pedestrian out of yeah. somebody. That's one of his smart cracks. Yeah. I, and I think that's cute and, and, uh... Yeah, it's not real inflicting or harmful. No, you know? no. He's always and, putting a little humor into it. Right. While he's, something you can laugh at. While he's, lifting up your, a, while he's lifting you up by your pockets, right? Right. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, 
you could, of course, you could take offense of that too if it was being said about you. Yeah. And uh, little uh, bits like that is uh, things like I like that sort of thing. Yeah, he, he said one, one time, he said, the more I hang around you imbeciles, the more I realize that I'm the most intelligent man I know. <laughs> oh, that sounds like it. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of a, one of his more famous lines. I got that out of Sports Illustrated. They picked up on some of those lines when they, when they were there uh, interviewing the Justice League tournament back in the, in the 60s. Um, what did you do when you weren't traveling with Fats? Did you just kind of, did he call home and let you know what was going on? Did he kind of keep you informed? Fats liked me real good. Yeah. And, uh... So he kept he, you in touch, kept in touch all the time, like what mm -hmm. was going on? That's good. Uh, when he was away, <coughs> he called me, I'd say, all, every night of the world. It was a rare thing that he wouldn't call. And, uh, he'd call sometimes during the day. Just wanted to say hello, what's going on? Yeah, maybe you fed and, the dogs and the cats. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> what was the deal with uh, the animals? I mean, he just, was it you or both of you that loved the animals so much? Was well, Dow, that little town down yeah. there, seemed that it was the dumping place for New Point <laughs> and all of uh, all the animals. this area. Yeah. They, and especially on that corner where we lived. <laughs> they drop uh, litters of kittens. What you looking at? I was looking at my tally light here. Make oh, sure that it's still recording. I thought you were looking in there. Uh, <clears throat> they drop uh, litters of kittens, brand new kittens. They drop baby puppies in a box. And uh, <laughs> in a box, huh? Yeah, usually in a box. And uh, oh, I tell you, it was a sad thing. <laughs> and. Uh, well, how many animals did you have at your he, height? He did that, or that happened long before Minnesota Fats ever came. Oh, really? But when he came there, and it was learned by the public that he took these animals in and fed them, and what he couldn't, uh, he and I couldn't cope with, uh, we asked for help from the vet, and the vet helped us. I've seen uh, Fats, he didn't necessarily pay for every trip to the vet, but I've seen uh, Fats pay the bill once a month or every five or six weeks compared to seven, eight hundred dollars at a time. Mm -hmm. Why do you think he was that way with animals? Well, he was just that, he just liked animals that well. He just it was crazy about yeah, it. Yeah, I read in one of the articles that he wouldn't even kill a moth. Yeah, and uh, he wouldn't take kill a fly. Yeah. Uh, he's told me a half a dozen different times, Evelyn, there's a fly in that bathroom. <laughs> and he's been in there, he told me how long he's been in there, three days. <laughs> He'll tell you how long. And he never goes out of the room, don't kill him. <laughs> Make sure you feed him, huh? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Don't, uh, don't uh, destroy that fly. <laughs> What's this thing? I heard that, that you know, I, I think of Fats and I kind of think of him as being kind of like W.C. Fields in his own way. Sharp, witty, you know, just kind of. And then I learned that he, he used to be in vaudeville. Was that? Uh, yeah, what, but what? I don't know that story. I didn't see him in vaudeville. Uh-huh. <coughs> did he ever talk about it or not? A little bit. What did he do? Did he just, I mean, was he just a stand-up? He was silent uh, movie time. I couldn't mean, imagine being in silent movies, but I can't tell you much story matter along with this. Just something. But simple. there used to be a troop of uh, midgets, midgets, <laughs> and uh, a troop of them, huh? Well, like that's what you call. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> a group of actors together, yeah. a troop sometimes. Uh -huh. And uh, what's a midget and a. Uh, What's the other little grotesque person? Uh, dwarf? Yeah. Midgets and dwarfs. Uh-huh. Uh, there was, like I say, uh, a troop of them. And uh, they were all uh, 
in the show business. And uh, so, I don't know if this is Fats' own story, I think. Uh, they <coughs> came to New York, and they didn't get a lot of work. I think they booked themselves. And uh, I don't remember the story, and, and uh, there wasn't much to the story to begin with. Anyway, they hired Fats. He was just a kid. And as the giant for the show. Oh, okay. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, did he, what did he enjoy besides pool? Girls. Girls, huh? He loved girls. Yeah, he, he truly did. And I, uh, it never bothered me. Do you like women or more or eating more? Well, they went together. He, Did they? Okay. Uh, he wouldn't uh, go to dinner uh, hardly without ever, you know, to have somebody with him had to. Mm -hmm. But did he enjoy anything besides pool and women and eating? Like, did he ever take, did you ever take a vacation somewhere like to the mountains or to the beach or? Every day was like a vacation to him. Yeah, just yeah. being alive. Yeah. Yeah. And what about his eating habits? Did he, you said you like fried chicken the best, right? Uh-huh. Did you like coming home and having fried chicken the best? Uh, yeah, he thought that I was a very good cook and uh, thought that I could make good, good chicken, good anything. I gotta ask you this. This is kind of a weird question, but did he snore? Man, he snored up all of this world. Terrible. Did he not snore? He snored terrible. And he knew it, huh? I'd wake him up wide awake and just keep prodding him and poking him up. Uh -huh. Until I get him wide awake, and uh -huh. uh, and he'd still beat me back to sleep and snore again. Okay. <laughs> well, I had to ask you that one. So you never took a vacation without without him carrying his pool stick with him. I mean, never just kind of did something without pool. That's right. And the pew was always with him. Okay. You remember when his own? You remember he had his own TV show, which kind of helped make him famous. I think. Did he really enjoy that? Yeah, did he? Sure did. And that, how long did that run for? Two, four well, years. I'm not. I don't even remember that. I was a young man then. I don't remember uh, too much. Well, That's I'd say he made uh, what is it? Twenty nine shows for a season, or twenty one uh, that they do in Hollywood for. Mm -hmm. Which is it? Do you know? No, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, for like a fall or yeah. spring. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think it's twenty nine, but it may be twenty one. Anyway, did you ever go to the shows? No, no. but through that I met quite a few of uh, the people. I met uh, Jaja Gabor. I heard, wasn't he, didn't, didn't she kind of make him famous in a way because he hustled her on TV? She never realized it? I don't think so. Okay, I heard something about that. And uh, what is that goofy one's name, the older woman that... Uh, uh, it's so crazy and we're such far out. Uh, Phyllis Diller? F Phyllis Diller. Yeah. And. Uh, Ever make Jack Benny or Bob Hope back then? No. No. Milton Burl? I think Burl. Yeah. Oh, I never met uh, Burl, but I met. Uh, well. But he did. He did a whole set of shows, like twenty some shows yeah, for one yeah. year. Yeah. Okay. I met uh, lots of actors and actresses. I just can't think of them now. Now you said something earlier about when you walked down the steps after getting married, and you were like always one step behind him. Uh huh. <laughs> so you really couldn't keep up with him, or you tried to? Well, I tried it was to. Tough but he to. He was always so busy and had his own thoughts on his mind. He'd just get out in front and, 
and when I gained speed, why well, he gained speed, he just stayed in front. Was there anything that really irritated him? Anything? Did just he just? No, I don't think so. Somebody killed a moth, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> sort of thing. Okay. Was he really the only person who could get away with calling women tomatoes? Well, uh, <laughs> did he ever call you a tomato? Yeah. Did he? Yeah. Uh, he was very complimentary with me. <laughs> and when we'd be in the car riding someplace, he'd tell me uh, that I would be a good looking old woman. <laughs> He bragged on my skin. I had very good skin. Okay. And, uh, well, I just was a good looking person and, uh, I behaved. I'd say I behaved real well, but I behaved especially the way he liked me to. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I just was exactly what he wanted. My, uh, Mm -hmm. My ways, uh, he liked, and my looks, and all those things. Yeah, yeah it just yeah. worked. Did, <coughs> there's a, a famous pool match years ago uh, when he beat Richie Florence out of a lot of money. Do you ever remember that? Who? Richie Florence. Richie Florence. He beat him on, in Johnson City out of a bunch of money. He waited on it for like a few days, waited until he got real tired and real... Richie. Yeah, real cocky, and then he ended up beating him out of all his money. I wonder if he ever shared anything to you about that match. Uh, Richie's now in a wheelchair. He had, I think he had a heart attack. He's been a real, in a wheelchair now for quite a few years. Where's he from? I think he's from the West Coast. I just I wonder if you ever... name is real familiar, but Yeah, because it happened in the late 60s. He did that in Johnson City. He beat him out of all his money. Because Richie was all pumped up, and he went there and in this fat just kind of waited on him like a big old frog, like I say, for about three uh -huh. days till he got out of line as far as sleeping and drinking and eating, and then he, then he beat him. You know. Was Richie on some kind of junk too? I don't know. I think it was just, he might have been, might have been sleep and booze and all that stuff, you know. But uh, who knows back then. There was a guy from uh, Connecticut, Johnny something, and uh, he was Italian, and he was... Johnny Irvellino? Johnny something. Johnny, and uh, he had a little bitty face with uh, real black eyes, and I call him Raisin Cookie. <laughs> and he loved that name, and uh, his face was little, and okay. those two uh, eyes looked like raisins in a cookie. <laughs> yeah, well, back then they kind of did a little bit of everything, didn't they? Some of them. Yeah. Um, Did he ever tell you who was his toughest opponent? Out of all the players he played, even when he was playing in his prime? Well, uh, you, Rags, you don't, uh, you remember that Rags name? Rags Fitzpatrick? Yeah, from uh, DC. Yeah. That's the guy that won a restaurant, didn't he? I don't know that. I heard he won, yeah, I read that he had beaten a guy out of a restaurant years ago. I didn't know that. Anyway, uh, Rags was a good money player. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Moscone was a, a tough money player. Mm hmm Uh, oh, yes, the name uh, Marcel Camp. He's from Detroit, and he was more Fats's age. He was as old as Fats, or maybe a year or two older. There's a guy named Well, yeah, the only guy I have, I have written down that I thought of was was Jack Forker from Detroit, but he was a three cushion hustler back then. Four acre. Four acre, right? Yeah, uh, he used to play. Uh, be in billiard tournaments. Right. Yeah, they said at one time that that Hoppy turned him down in a big money match. 
because of, I guess he's a, I guess he's a great player. Uh huh. Okay. Um, so did he talk about all his matches to you pretty much? I mean, kind of let you know what was going on. Could you talk about what his matches when he matched up with people? No. Oh no. Um, well, I when you were I there to see him. Uh, the reason for it was because I was usually with him and, and heard all the conversation and the build-up. Yeah. Yeah, the build-up was probably just, just as good as the matches sometimes, wasn't it? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Any classic lines that you want to, that you remember? I know one of you. He goes, I know everything that everybody else knows and nobody knows what I know. <laughs> Oh, there's lots of those, but I, uh, none come to mind right now. Yeah, somebody years ago called him a has-been. This is, you know, in the late in the 60s. Uh -huh. and he says, well, if I'm a has-been, I'm certainly glad I'm not one of those is-beans. One of what? <laughs> not an is-bean. I'm gonna, I'm, I, I is gonna be somebody, you know? <laughs> oh, uh <-huh. laughs> So. Yeah, they didn't have many lines in, in some of the older magazines, but uh, I mean, he probably would come out with more in one tournament than you'd, you'd get in print probably in ten years. But um, yeah, when I was in college back in the late '60s, he used to come to Crazy Horse Billiards looking for me, just because I was the hot stick. And he uh, always did a couple things that kind of amazed me. Actually, he used to play me some straight pool once in a while when I was there. And entertain me, and but he always was trying to get in my pocket. Now who's this? Pats. Oh yeah. Yeah, he used to come down to Crazy Horse. Trying to beat you, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Did he think you were a real hustler? No, I was just a young hot shot kid, you know. That thought oh, I was. Oh yeah. That I was, you know. He's trying to put you in your place. <laughs> yes, he was. <laughs> um. Did he admire anybody as a player? Admire him? I don't think so. I think he thought he was a bit. And I think he was too. Yeah. When it came to uh, down to the wire, he maybe didn't beat every uh, session, but when if he had a second engagement or they kept on playing, uh, it finally came down to where Fats wound up with the money. Yeah. That's what I. That's my opinion. Yeah, that was kind of special about him. He. He'd been in pretty much every position that you could possibly be in, and he knew what to do in every position. And eventually, uh -huh. he knew, like you said, when he was younger, that the time had basically worked he its knew way. He had to manage money. Yeah. He uh, would be in a real lively room, and of course, uh, if he had a good game going, everybody in the room would quit their table, quit playing their game, and watch his. Uh -huh and uh, bet on his game. And, uh... Yeah. The owner of the pool room didn't like it too much, no. in a way, because all the tables would shut down. Right. Yeah, they do that in pool rooms nowadays, where they'll, they'll put on a great match, match play tape. All the people from the tables will check their tables out and come up to the bar and watch. Right. Instead of, uh, keep playing. But it does stimulate later. They go, oh, let's go back and try this. We saw this shot. So it does work out both ways. Um, did he have you figured out like he did his opponents? <laughs> Why how you mean that? Well, did he always kind of know what was going on with you? Did he kind of, was he aware where you were at all the time? Uh, he, uh, he was, in a way, he was very interested in me because he liked me, but he wasn't suspicious. But, mm -hmm. I'll say this, I wouldn't dare uh, take a flyer and think that I'll pull something over on him, like, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, go out with somebody. Yeah. Because he's too damn unpredictable. <laughs> I might think he's in Chicago, and before I could go on a date that would last four or five hours, why, well, he might be home. Uh, by the time I get there, not that he's suspicious, but he's unpredictable. Yeah. <laughs> and he called me often enough. Yeah, there's enough. no routine to his life, is there? No. And he called me often enough that uh, you'd think that I could go by that, but I couldn't necessarily. He could call me and 
tell me, well, I'm going to stay over for another day or two. Or he could call you and say he's down the block, filling you know, up his car, he's driving or, uh, He could call and say, I'm going to stay over for a couple more days and immediately change his mind when he walked away from the phone and get in the car and drive home. <laughs> what did he do to pick you up when you were not feeling too well, like when you were down or depressed or whatever? Or not? I didn't have that at times like that. I always. He, he didn't have anything special that he say to kind of pick you up? <coughs> like ever sitting in that pool? To, he was good to me with money. Uh huh. Very good to me with money. And uh, so he gave me money and and we ate good, always went to places where we both liked to eat. Uh -huh. And uh, well, it's just good. You know, I said to you on the phone a few weeks ago, you know, you lock fats in a room with, a, with like a psychiatrist and he'll have them figured out in a few hours. And what did you say to me? <laughs> he'll be wearing his what? <laughs> He'd be wearing his apron when he came out of that room. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was a pretty, I enjoyed hearing that. I told you that on the phone? Yeah. You had said something earlier um, about him being double smart and triple smart. Uh-huh. What happened when he became double smart? Oh, it had to, to, to do, I'm sure, with betting in some way. Uh, he made Whatever he was, whatever his status was in Chicago before that tournament started, it doubled when he won all of those, uh, picked the, all of those winners. It yeah. was uh, double smart, it jumped to triple smart right then and there, something like that. Okay. Did you ever beat anything, beat anybody of anything really unusual besides money? I mean, just something. Beat them for anything unusual? Yeah, like out of the ordinary thing that you'd bet for. Like this, what was his name? Beat uh, beat somebody out of a restaurant. Uh, like Rads Fitzpatrick in D.C. won a restaurant. It seems like he beat uh, this camp. Uh, that I mentioned a while ago, beat him for a car, said he made a pedestrian out of him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, beating somebody out of a car back then, that was a big, a big score. That's uh, beat camp one time in Chicago, uh, not in Chicago, but in Detroit. Uh, I don't know what time they started playing, I think in the late afternoon. And uh, they played all night, and they played until 9 o'clock the next morning. And uh, How many hours could he play in a row? Oh, he's played uh, 24 hours different mm -hmm. times. So uh, anyway, uh, the game finally broke up at 9 o'clock in the morning. And uh, So Fats bought lots of new cars. He never bought a second-hand car. Well, I guess he did during the war because cars were so hard to get. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, if you traded cars, you, there's a rule, you couldn't find a new car. Mm -hmm. You had to buy a second-hand car. <coughs> so that way, he maybe had a few second-hand cars. But anyway, he beat the camp for $9,500. And uh, so as we're leaving the pool room, he says, uh, let's go look at cars. Let's go buy a new car. You can't overheard him. No, no. He just said it to me. <clears throat> so we went and we bought a Buick convertible. It was red with a white ride top. And uh, we went and uh, parked on the street that was before the days of such hard tough parking. And it happened that uh, that we parked right under our window. 
in the hotel. So we went to bed like at noon. We got this car and drove it and parked it right under our window and we went to bed. And uh, so we got up, whenever we got up, but I don't know how long we slept. Anyway, I looked out the window and it was before the days of air conditioning and all that and uh, the window was open and I looked out the window at our new car and here on that white top somebody had flipped a cigarette out the window and there was no wind it lay there and it burned a hole in that brand new convertible it was scorched and uh, so we got right in the car and we took the car back to where we bought it and uh, they said, we'll leave it here, we'll put a new top on it. And they did. Mm -hmm. Put a brand new top on that brand new car. <laughs> and it was probably me that flipped the cigarette out the window. <laughs> the last cigarette I smoked was uh, while I sat under that dryer in that place where I broke my leg. Yeah. I never smoked a cigarette since then. There was that, I was going to tell you that one little line that this gal said, one of the hippie gals back from the late 60s, that was in Johnson City, and she came up to Fats, and she said, you want to get a signature? Uh-huh. Well, of course he had a stamp, uh -huh. as you know. And he pulled out his stamp, to stamp, I don't know, it was a program or something like that, and she looked at him, she goes, if I want a stamp, I'll go to the bank. And he didn't say anything. Because he didn't know what to say after that. Uh-huh. <laughs> that was why I'll never forget that, because she said that, that line to him. And <laughs> I think by her saying the bank, it really kind of uh -huh. caught him off guard, because he always took everything to the bank, or to the heart, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, man. Um, a friend of mine the other day knew him years ago too. He used to go that that friend of mine I'll tell you from Carmel that used to go with me to uh, the tournaments. He said that that Fast used Fast used to carry around these large checks uncashed and show them to people, like his bait or something like that. He'd say, you know, I got a check from like the casino for twenty thousand or something like that. He used to just kind of use those. Say, I got so much money, I got a check here. I don't even need the cash. You ever remember hearing about those? I know one check 